Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an, uh, an honor to address the issue of uh, <coughs> pain in the ICU, and it's always difficult to make a choice. What I would like to do today is share with you our ideas about postoperative evidence-based analgesia, fact or fiction. <coughs> so it's obvious if you think about pain, there are a significant number of determinants of pain ranging from individual differences in pain threshold, the genetic background, <coughs> the developmental stage, and whether you will be able to judge upon pain as a caregiver. Is there any way in which we can objectivate pain in an individual? And obviously the amount of illness also plays a role, mainly related also to what would be the drug response in the individual and the environment. So pain in itself is a rather complicated. So in our research, we thought it would be best to get to a very simple and clear-cut issue being there is a <clears throat> trauma uh, to the body, mainly a surgical trauma, and let's see what we can do. <clears throat> if you read about studies looking into the issue of how to evaluate pain, there is a myriad of endpoints. And I just listed here a number of them. <clears throat> it goes from behavioral assessment, whether this would be really showing pain, yes or no. Self-report has been identified as the gold standard, at least in those who are over three years of age. But then there is this whole variety of outcome parameters which you can find in uh, pain studies. So looking in more detail, you have to realize that there is a very significant difference between what is the primary neurobiological phenomena being nociception and the start of firing of the pain receptors, what we have in clinical practice is pain behavior. And on the other side of the slide, I've just listed where we are in daily clinical practice. So we are having made appointments regarding pain behavior. And in this, there is a significant number of overlapping items which you will find in pain assessment instruments. And more and more you see PKPD studies. I will come back to that a little bit later. But you have to realize that the real, the central nervous system, that's where the pain becomes conscious. And we don't have much instruments to look at the central nervous system in a repeated manner, especially not in the ICU. So this is just taken from a very nice review published by Carl von Bayer and others in 2000 seven in pain, which gives you a very nice overview of the different pain assessment instruments used around the world. But if you look into the ICU population, 80% of all our children admitted to PICUs are less than three years of age and generally considered not to be able for reliable self-report. So if you think about opioids, there are still a number of very fundamental questions. And if you, read text, if you read textbooks of anesthesiology, you will see that there is a so-called therapeutic window of 10 to 20 nanograms per ml, which is related to the measurement of plasma morphine levels. That's about the best we have. But the effect of morphine, obviously, is not what is circulating in your blood. What you really want to know is what's going on in the central nervous system. Then you have to realize that there are strong analgesic and anti-analgesic effects of the metabolites of morphine being the M3 and M6 glucuronide. And nobody has ever shown that there is a correlation between these plasma levels and pain scores. Even at the same dosages, the plasma levels do show an enormous deviation, not related to the amount of pain. And if you really want to know, which will never happen in the human, because you have to use radioactive labeled morphine, it would be really nice to know whether, when you are born, whether the distribution and the occupancy of the opioid receptor is the same when you are born preterm, when you're laying in the ICU for one month and having been inflicted on repeated procedural painful events and whether you have had major surgery. So this is also uh, brought to the attention that the large variability associated with infusion rates means that subsequent diffusion rates will depend on feedback from pain scores, whether they have been validated, yes or no, the use of adjuvant medications and adverse events. So let's look 
about the questions we have with regards to opioids. There are questions related to dosing. There are questions related to combination therapy. And in many institutions, you will see, especially in post-operative uh, situations, that patients come in with a combination of morphine and paracetamol, being uh, IV or in a different way. What actually is this level of evidence? And then there is ongoing literature, uh, especially in the preterm, whether opioids induce neuroapoptosis and what will be the long-term effects, but this is another lecture which I will not give today. So let's get back about 30 years ago and try to realize where our dosages come from. And if you carefully look in the literature, and this is really old literature from 30 years ago, the world has started to give a loading dose of 50 microns to 100 microns per kg, and an infusion around 10 microns per kg per hour to reach steady state. But if you carefully look where this publication and knowledge comes from, this is based on four children, one to seven days of age, and another six up till 90 days of age, and another six up till 180 days of age. So we have given this kind of dosages for 30 years based on in total 16 children. So you might think that there would be any rescue coming from this publication. There's another publication, 20 kids, 1 to 18 days of age, but this is coming all from one publication from Ann Lynn at that time who described post-cardiac surgery patients. So we never thought about whether this would be the optimal dosage, yes or no, we just gave it. And maybe we have overdosed our children with opioids for the last 30 years. This is a busy slide, but what, it only sh what I would like to share with you is in the context of a randomized controlled trial in which we wanted to sort it out whether continuous morphine would be better or uh, uh, inferior to intermittent, again, IV morphine, that the age of the children, these were zero to four weeks, this is the metabolic stress response looking into epinephrine and norepinephrine. You see there's hardly any increase in nor, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine when you are zero to four weeks of age. But when you are one to three years of age, then you do see much more this ebb and flow stage as you would recognize in adults. Just showing you the results in the newborns, visual analog scale and the comfort score was used in that study. You see here the classical 10 microns per kg per hour in ventilated infants. And this was really no difference in children who had continuous morphine versus the one who had IV morphine, uh, but at an intermittent uh, schedule of three hours having the same dose. So at that time, uh, which was really based on one of our pediatric anesthesiologists who came back from Melbourne in which he had seen continuous morphine infusion, before that time we were giving intermittent IV morphine. There was no difference with regards to the outcome, and from that point on we decided it would be very easy to give continuous morphine infusions. So this has been the base, actually, of trying to couple pharmacokinetics on pharmacodynamics. So this uh, comfort score, which was later on developed by Monique van Dijk, is based on data from the same patients in which we had morphine M3 and M6 glucuronide, as well as metabolic stress hormone profiles. And so this score, which we have been using now for the last 12 years and has been spread worldwide, is one of the very, very few pain scales which also has physiological and pharmacokinetic background and uh, interpretation. So what about paracetamol? Obviously, paracetamol has been there for about more than 100 years. Still, the analgesic effect is not completely clear. There are more and more suggestions that it has something to do with the serotonin uh, containing fibers in the central nervous system. But <clears throat> more and more, we were confronted from our anesthesiology colleagues that we should give a combination of morphine and paracetamol. And when this came on board in our institution about 10 years ago, we raised the question, what is really the evidence to give a combination therapy of morphine and paracetamol? At that time, the evidence was based 
on seven RCTs with PCA morphine and acimetophen, which is the US name for paracetamol, showing that the combination had a significant morphine sparing effect, 20%, but did not change the incidence of morphine-related adverse effects in the postoperative period, clearly coming from adults. So adult literature was just transferred to the pediatric age group, and this was the reason that we should give this combination. So what we did, we did another randomized controlled trial at that time by Caroline van der Marel, in which we had a group of patients following major non-cardiac surgery at the median age of two months, in which in total 54 children were included, and she could not prove any paracetamol sparing or morphine sparing effect of giving paracetamol. At that time in the Netherlands, we did not have IV paracetamol, while in uh, Belgium there was for about 30 years there was pro-paracetamol. So we did not find any morphine sparing effect. This uh, whole context was then abandoned, but we moved on trying to see whether we could come into a situation in which you don't need morphine at all. The way we did that is that we took all our data from three different trials, being the two trials that I showed you before, so IV morphine intermittent versus continuous, and the morphine paracetamol trial. We added on all data from a study we did to sort out whether it would be advisable to give morphine in ventilated preterm infants without surgery, which we published in another paper. So by taking the approach of population PKPD, the model was developed by Katharine Knibbe and our group, in which we uh, <coughs> were trying to show that with a very low loading dose and maintenance dose, that we could come to a 50% reduction in maintenance dose in newborns younger than 10 days. This was coming out of the model based on this pharmacokinetic data and all the variables that you could include into a population PKPD model. This is nice for people who like to do modeling, but obviously you have to be able to use it in daily clinical practice. And this is a busy slide, but this has been our pain algorithm. So for postoperative pain in our institution for the first 48 hours after surgery, we apply this validated comfort score and under NRS pain. And depending on the score, you will go on to give additional boluses, yes or no, or go to the sedation protocol. And then what you see here for uh, about a decade, when you are below 11 days, you get 10 microns per kg per hour when you're over 15. And the nurse can do this repeatedly for three times before she calls in one of the physicians. So this is completely nurse-led protocol. We're not involved in it unless there is trouble. So if you want to do studies, obviously you have to have this kind of PD-guided uh, parameters. And taking this, we have done this for not only morphine, as a model drug, but also for midazolam, vancomycin, and under circumstances of differences in renal clearance. Because what we have found in our earlier studies, that morphine plasma concentrations are all over the place in the traditional dosing scheme in microns per kg per hour. So based on that population PKPD model, our modelers could predict that this would be the plasma levels in an adjusted dosing scheme in micrograms per kg to the amount of 1.5 per hour. And this is a busy slide, but what it actually shows you that these are the individual uh, and predicted concentrations of morphine, the M3 and M6 glucuronide, versus the observed concentrations. So I will tell you about the trial that we did underlying this kind of Drafts, but it really shows a very nice correlation between predicted and really measured values of morphine and its degradation products. So what we try to do is looking into a scheme when you're less than 10 days of age, instead of giving um, uh, 10 microns per kg per hour, you start with 2.5 micrograms per kg per hour. When you're over 10 days of age, you get 5. So the dose reduction in the newborn was about 
based on all the literature and our own practice for the last 30 years. So in the meantime, IV paracetamol became available in the Netherlands. And giving the background of the worries about induced neuroapoptosis and uh, increased neuroapoptosis by exposing the newborn brain to opioids, we conducted another randomized controlled trial in which we compared IV morphine in the new dosing scheme versus IV paracetamol in neonates and young infants following non-cardiac surgery. Double-blind randomized controlled trial, 70 patients were included, stratified for age group, and rescue therapy obviously was IV morphine in both groups. This resulted in a very nice publication in the YAMA in 2013, and I'm happy to share the results with you. And this is a busy slide, but I'll walk you through. So if you look at cumulative morphine dose, obviously in the paracetamol group, it's much less than in the group which gets continuous morphine. That's not surprising. That's just internal control of the trial in itself. But what we did find that the rescue morphine dose, the median rescue morphine dose in both groups did not differ. That the rescue morphine dosages, so the number of dosages, did not differ either. And that patients receiving rescue morphine was the same in both groups. We were really surprised and uh, also very happy about that because the conclusion from that is that there is equipotency between paracetamol and morphine as the primary analgesic, as the additional need for morphine showed no differences between the study groups. Logical consequence of this finding is that we don't give morphine anymore following major non-cardiac surgery in our institution in children less than one year of age. So we have now implemented as the primary analgesic for major non-cardiac surgery in children less than one year of age, IV paracetamol. Obviously, when there is rescue therapy needed, they get morphine, and soon we will have the implementation of a one-year compliance study to see whether we can not only justify this statement, but I would be very happy if somebody from another institution would do the same study to see whether this is also transferable to other units. One other important issue which I would like to raise, uh, which doesn't happen too much in our institution at least, is postoperative IV morphine titration. So if you're happy, the, the nurses are very happy somewhere in the evening, everybody goes to sleep, and then in the ward round in the morning, people start to think about titrating down morphine. I'm sure it's much better in all your institutions, but Nurses like it in my institutions to be very quiet, both them colleagues and uh, the patients, uh, which means that I think that there is really a place for morphine titration if you have validated pain scores and they are really too low to start to titrate down morphine. And what we did, in, and which is not rocket science at all, in a small study in patients with esophageal atresia, and we had a very motivated uh, PhD, Student, she was sitting next to the bedside, and any, every time that the comfort score was too low, she raised her hand and said to the nurse that he could titrate down morphine. In half of the patients, there was no need for morphine at all after 12 hours following a toracotomy in the newborn. So I think we're really overdosing, not only based on the PKPD model that I presented to you, but also that we try to forget, not try to forget, but we do forget a structured way of morphine titration. The same holds true for analgesia and sedation after pediatric cardiac surgery. This is still also a myriad of um, uncertainties, and people are so afraid of having any pain post cardiac surgery that in many institutions, we just did a survey around the world looking into the dosages of morphine. And so in many institutions, the dosages of morphine are now between 40 and 80 microns per kg per hour in the first four to six hours after pediatric cardiac surgery. So this obviously is a very good argument 
to do the study that we did in non-cardiac patients to repeat the study in cardiac patients and we're now in the last phase of organizing a nationwide study in which we would like to compare IV paracetamol versus low-dose morphine in pediatric cardiac patients. And so this is coming from a review from uh, Andy Wolf from Bristol two years ago. It was still stating that studies with morphine and ramifentanil have shown that after cardiac surgery, there's a combination of an increase in volume of distribution and fall in drug clearance. But there are no systematic analysis uh, ever been done in this particular age group and uh, way of operation. Few words about ketamine. What do we know about ketamine for perioperative pain management? This is a meta-analysis published two years ago, again in pediatric anesthesia. But what you can immediately sense here, that they are dealing with a PACU, so that the administration of ketamine was associated with decreased PACU postoperative pain intensity, but it had no postoperative opioid sparing effect. Obviously, older kids surgery in which not necessarily you need to go to the ICU. There is now in the anesthesiology literature an ongoing debate uh, about the use of esketamine in patients who undergo major scoliosis surgery, and the results are very conflicting at this moment. The last uh, trial was just published last year, again in pediatric anesthesia, showing no effect of esketamine as a standard of postoperative analgesia in patients operated upon idiopathic scoliosis, and you all know this is a very extensive way of surgery and a very painful procedure. Other drugs like tramadol versus fentanyl have been evaluated. Tramadol turned out to be as effective as fentanyl for postoperative pain relief in neonates, but it did not offer uh, significant advantages over fentanyl with regard to the duration of mechanical ventilation and time to reach full enteral nutrition. Diclofenac, a very nice uh, drug as well, uh, here <coughs> based on the uh, data which were available a couple of years ago, we performed a meta-analysis uh, in patients 1 to 12 years of age, uh, single dosages uh, in suppositorius or oral diclofenac uh, uh, to reach an area under the curve uh, up till a dosage of 50 mi uh, milligrams in adults. So this is uh, more or less what we have for the most common used analgesic following major surgery uh, in children. So where are we? I think that we have to realize and still have to realize that pain behavior is not equal to nociception. So nociception is the neurobiological phenomena of activating specific fibers, whether they are in organs or at the body surface. What we have made altogether is appointments that at least that we can say, this is what we consider pain. But none of the pain scores that we have ever used or developed, and there is an enormous redundancy in pain scores, has ever proven to measure pain only. As Pete Loire already said, Pain and fear are very difficult to distinguish. We're still in the phase of long-term neurodevelopmental outcome studies. There's a very elegant study just finished. It's called the GUESS study, guided by Andrew Davidson from Melbourne, who were looking into local regional anesthesia, analgesia versus general anesthesia in a group of over 700 children worldwide who underwent ingenual hernia repair the primary endpoint of that study is neurodevelopmental outcome at five years. So the study is based on a single procedure, two ways of analgesia, but looking into neurodevelopmental outcome to sort out whether it really has an effect on neuro, uh, neurodevelopment when you are using anesthetics and analgesic drugs in the early age groups. And <clears throat> I think we still have important issue on pharmacokinetics and dynamics of analgo sedatives that need a further evaluation. So in conclusion, as a take-home message, I think that we can, based on our um, data, <clears throat> come up with the idea that the role of morphine as a primary choice for postoperative analgesia, non-cardiac, is controversial, that we should dose morphine on appropriate PKPD modeling, following obviously by proof of principle studies in which I would 
uh, share the data with you, and that the ultimate aim, obviously, is the absence of pain evaluated by validated pain scores for that specific study population that you have under your uh, responsibility and circumstances, and that the long-term effects of neonatal use of opioid should still be evaluated. Thank you very much.